Good morning. As you know, for the last couple of weeks, I've been looking with you at that word of Jesus in John chapter 4 about true worship. True worshippers, he says, are those who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, I was going to carry on and say uh, a bit more about aspects of worship, but since the beginning of the week, there's a little phrase that's just got hold of me and stayed with me. And I felt I needed to bring it to you this morning. It's, it's a phrase from that story we read of Jesus raising to life the daughter of Jairus. And when Jesus said... Uh, to the people, why all this weeping and wailing? You know, why are all these people weeping and wailing at the house of Jairus? He added the phrase about the child, she is not dead, but asleep. And it just seems to me that is also a word about the church in this country, in this community, in the West generally, and how we should think about it. Some people, it seems to me, have a very black and white view of churches. Some churches are alive, other churches are dead. It's as simple as that. Now, it is possible for a church to be dead, Jesus, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, speaks about a church in a place called Sardis. Now, if you've been visiting that area of um, the Near East, and you'd asked uh, people, where are the lively churches around here? I think most people would have answered Sardis. If you're looking for a lively church... That's where you want to be, Sardis. Jesus says of, of the church in Sardis, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. But in the very next verse, Jesus goes on to say to this dead church, wake up. And as the rest of that letter to the church in Sardis shows, there's still hope, even for Sardis. You see, hot-headed Christians can sometimes write off dead churches. So often we can seem to assume that human liveliness is the same thing as spiritual life. Now, the two often do go together. They certainly can. But human liveliness is not the same thing as spiritual life. As in Sardis, which had a reputation for being lively, but actually, in spiritual terms, it was dead. But Jesus never wants to write off dead churches. He wants to revive them. He wants to renew them. And I think these words of Jesus about Jairus' daughter are, as I say, a word to the church and how we think about the church here in the West. She is not dead, but asleep. Now, there are a number of reasons why the church can be or can seem to be asleep. And by that, I don't mean boring. By sleeping or asleep, I simply mean the church often doesn't seem to be displaying God's dynamic life in a way that really advances the kingdom of God. I think what is sleeping is the church's potential to display and share the dynamic life of Jesus in a way that is impacting large numbers of people in the community. And in that sense, the church can often seem 
to be dead? Jesus says no. Asleep, maybe. People can be asleep in different ways, can't they? Some people choose to take a sleeping pill. Others can just sort of nod off in a comfortable chair. Now, it can sometimes seem as though some churches have chosen to take a moral and spiritual sleeping pill. They've just chosen to opt for a traditional church life that has no obvious signs of the life of Jesus about it. But sometimes churches, individual Christians, might just, in a sense, have spiritually nodded off for a bit. But either way, I want to say over the church, in this community, in this country, in the West generally, what Jesus said over this little 12-year-old girl. She is not dead for the sleep. People can think about Christians and churches that are, or should we say, seem to be asleep, lacking obvious dynamic spiritual life in a number of ways. And you see several of them in this story. The first, and this is really the only one that I think is a positive attitude, the first is urgency. Verses 22 to 23, one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Now, there's nothing wrong with that urgency, even if it's bordering on the desperate. Jairus was right. To come and plead with Jesus. And it's right for us to plead with Jesus for the life and the health of the church. He pleaded earnestly, Mark says. Are we as passionately committed to pleading for the life of the church in our community as Jairus was to plead for the life of his daughter and his family? Urgency. Second attitude or approach, frustration. Now here we come to the story of this woman who, when Jesus set off to go with Jairus to his house to minister to his dying daughter, he gets, well, as Jairus would no doubt have thought about it, sidetracked. A woman comes up to Jesus in the crowd. She's seeking healing for her medical problem, she reaches out, she, she touches the clothing of Jesus, she feels in her body that she's delivered from her uh, disease, but Jesus knows that something has happened, and he looks around in the crowd and he says, who touched me? And the disciples start debating with him, how can you say that? There's a whole crowd pressing in around you, and you're saying, who touched me? And, and Jai what's Jairus doing through all of this? I bet in modern terms, he'd have been standing there looking at his watch, saying, come on, this is urgent. We have time for this. I need to get you to my house before it's too late. And then it goes from bad to worse. Jesus wants to meet with this woman. He wants to talk with her. He wants to spend time reassuring her and giving her an extra blessing. And Jairus was getting so frustrated. People can very understandably get frustrated when God hasn't intervened to answer our prayers and revive his church in the way that we'd hoped he would. And it hasn't happened yet. Mm. Now here's a challenge for us. It's important that we remain passionate and determined, but without letting that spill over into frustration and irritation when Jesus doesn't seem to be doing what we've asked him to do. 
frustration. And I think a lot of frustration that some people seem to show with church may actually be frustration with God because he's not doing what we hoped he would do. Urgency, frustration. Here's a third attitude. Resignation. Resignation. Verse 35, while Jesus was uh, still speaking, that's speaking with this woman, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Why bother? Why bother with the church? Why bother carrying on hoping that God will renew and refresh and revive his church? Why bother seeking his face to pray for the church? Why not just accept that we're flogging a dead horse? That things are bad and they're not going to get better. Why bother? When people are terminally ill, there can come a point at which it is right to say, medically, they're not going to recover. But you can never say that about the Church of Jesus Christ. Not even about sleepy churches, or even, as far as we can see, dead churches. And just as we must never let our eagerness to see God moving amongst us develop into frustration because he isn't doing yet, so we, we must never give up trusting that he will. Never become resigned to the why bother attitude. The church is what it is. The community is what it is. So why bother hoping that anything can change? I will say more about this in a moment, but, but there is one very good reason why we should bother. Why it's worth bothering. Why you can never write the church off as dead. That's because the head of the church is alive forevermore. Jesus, the head of the church, is alive. And as long as the head is alive, there's life for the body and the potential of the renewal of life for the body. Resignation. And then fear. When Jairus has been told that your daughter has died, Jesus tells Jairus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Choose not to give in to fearing the worst. Verse 36 actually begins, the NIV translates it, overhearing what they said, Jesus told him. Actually, the same word could mean and be translated as ignoring what they said. And in fact, I think that's likely to be what is meant. Uh, in this verse for two reasons. Firstly, that's the meaning of this word in the only other place it occurs in the New Testament, which is in Matthew 18. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church. That's the only other place where this verb, which could mean either ignoring, refusing to hear, refusing to listen, or overhearing. It's the only other place it's used, and it clearly means refusing to listen. But the other reason I think it means ignoring is that Jesus doesn't actually need to overhear anything in order to know it. Remember that incident earlier in Mark's Gospel where um, when Jesus says to the man who was let down uh, through the roof of the house, Son, your sins are forgiven. The, um, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who are there Say, in their hearts, they're thinking, this is blasphemy. Who can 
for sin, forgive sins, but God alone. And it says that Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their hearts, said to them. Jesus doesn't need to overhear it to know it. Because Jesus knows what is in the heart of people. So I, I think, in all probability, this verse in, in Mark um, probably means that Jesus was ignoring what the people said. He chose not to take on board what was being said. She's dead. That's it. End of story. Jesus says, no, it isn't. I'm not going to choose to believe that. And he invites Jairus and he invites us to choose to ignore those cynical voices that want us to believe that the church is past it. The bride of Christ is not past it. But that brings us to a, a fifth possible response to the sleepiness of some churches. Lamentation. Verse 38, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. These were people who were sort of ritual mourners. They would go wherever there'd been a death in a household. They'd go and they'd engage in that kind of, um, you know, Middle Eastern practice of loudly weeping and wailing where there's been a death, in order to help the family to express their grief and their bereavement. You see, humanly speaking, that's all anyone can do for this little girl, man. She's beyond all human help. All we can do is weep and wail over her. And there are people who will weep and lament over the state of the church. And Jesus says, why all this commotion and wailing? You see, there are very good reasons for not simply bemoaning the state of Western Christianity. In verse 40, we read, as Jesus uh, is going into the room where the daughter of, of Jairus is lying, it says he put them all out. All these weepers and wailers, all these ritual mourners, he put them out. Just as he was later to drive the money changers out of the temple. So he here drives these ritual mourners out of Jairus' home. And I think we can decide... Once and for all, that we are going to put out all those voices inside us that want us to just mourn and lament and weep and, you know, feel nostalgic about the times when the church was in better shape, but oh dear, we're past it now. And what Jesus did with these people who were weeping and mourning, he put them out we need, by the grace of the Lord Jesus and in the strength of his spirit, to say, I'm putting thoughts like that out of my mind. I'm not going to give them house room. And then here's a sixth reaction. Mockery. When Jesus has said, um, she is not dead but asleep, it says in verse 40, but they laughed at him. They laughed at him. It is absurd to think that the church can live again, isn't it? That question that God asked Ezekiel when he was in the valley of the dry bones, can these dry bones live again? I think there are those who if you were to ask that, or answer that question about the church in the Western world and say, yes, yes, these dry bones can live again. They laugh at you. And 
And that's how they reacted when Jesus said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. Now those are some of the ways in which people can think about the deadness of church life. Not always, not in every church, but sadly, all too often in our Western culture today. So if that is not the right way to think, apart from that first one of urgently pleading with Jesus, if that's not the right way to think, what is the right way? Verse 36, Jesus says to Jairus, after he said, don't be afraid, he says, just believe. Just believe. And what he means here is, look, Jairus, you showed faith when you first came to me and pleaded earnestly for your daughter. Carry on having that same faith. Carry on holding on to that same faith, because even if a situation has reached a point where it's beyond all human hope, it is not beyond Jesus' power. Carry on believing. She is not dead, but asleep. And Jesus can raise the dead just as surely as he can rouse the dozing. Either way, just believe. The church here in this community in this country, is not dead. And there are two reasons for saying that. The first I've mentioned already, the head of the church is fully alive forever and ever. And the church cannot be dead as long as the head of the church is living. But the other reason I say the church is not dead is that there are still lots of vital signs in so many churches. Maybe not the really dynamic life that we would long to see impacting whole communities. Not quite as much of that as we would like to see, let's say. But the church is not dead. Maybe in some ways, asleep. But if you think that that's the end of the church, well, try asking Jairus' daughter a few minutes later. So what for us is the challenge of this word over the church, she is not dead but asleep? Four things I want to leave with us as the challenge. The first is, that we make sure that we do not entertain, we don't uh, give house room to those wrong or negative attitudes that we see in this story. The fear, the frustration, the, the lamentation, the mockery. We don't allow ourselves to become cynical about the church and its prospects. Don't give up on the church. As long as the head of the church is alive, there's hope and life for the church. And I think we need to practice disciplining our thoughts as soon as that cynicism or fearing the worst comes into our minds. We just need to say, I'm not, I'm not going to entertain that. We may not stop, be able to stop the thoughts coming, but we don't have to harbour them. We don't have to hold on to them. I think it's um, somewhere out in the east, maybe China, I don't know, there's a, there's a saying, uh, you can't stop a bird flying into a tree, but you can stop it building a nest there. And maybe we can't stop the thoughts coming, but we can stop them finding a home in our minds, putting down roots there to change the metaphor. Don't entertain the negative attitudes that we see in this story. 
Don't give up on church. Secondly, the second challenge is that we plead earnestly with Jesus. Just as Jairus did. And we say to Jesus about the church, what he said about his daughter, will you please place your hands on her so that she will be healed and live? Third challenge, just believe. Just believe. The church is not going to be revived if we tinker with the structures and organisations of church life. Try and give them a bit of a polish. I'm not saying there aren't things that we couldn't look at doing better. There's always a place for that. But just believe. Believe, trust that Jesus is sovereign over his church. That he is the Lord of life. And that he will breathe new life and new vitality into his church. Just believe the best for the church. And finally, speak, pray prophetically over the church. Pray over the church. Speak over the church. That word of Jesus, she is not dead. Asleep maybe, but not dead. And so we can pray over the church what Jesus said to Jairus' daughter. And at the moment Jesus said it, medically, she was dead. But Jesus spoke to her, little girl, I say to you, get up! Because the word of Jesus can impart life even where there is death. Church of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I say, arise to new life for the glory of God. Amen.